I think Jeanette is up next. All right. Hello. Um, I'm really glad to be going after Nate here because we're, we do a lot of play at the library. Um, play is integral in um, outreach with the public, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about how libraries are using VR to engage the public and more specifically public libraries. So um, a lot of you are probably in academia. Um, so we're not going to be talking about um, your university public library or your university library, um, the public libraries that have kind of a different funding structure and a completely different um, audience. So um, first of all, I'm uh, Jeanette Lair and I am a student engagement and outreach consultant here at Indiana University but I've actually only had this job for a week. So um, I'll actually be talking more about um, the position I had previous to that. Um, I was the uh, digital creativity specialist at Monroe County Public Library. And that is the library here in Bloomington, Indiana. If you get a chance to check it out while you're in town, um, it's just down the street on Kirkwood. Um, there is a um, digital creativity center, which was kind of what my uh, role was to kind of do the day to day um, operations in the Digital Creativity Center. There's a, a video studio with a green screen, um, two audio production studios, and uh, four high-powered iMac workstations with the full Adobe Creative Cloud Suite and other digital software for people to use and be creative. Um, and so that was kind of my role, but I also um, was uh, interested in providing programming for the public in all kinds of different emerging technologies, did a lot of 3D printing and a lot of VR. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today is my engagement with the public at the library using VR. So um, again, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about what other libraries are doing mostly in the US, um, but just a, a little survey of, yeah, a little survey of what they're doing, but then I'm going to sp specifically focus more on Monroe County Public Library because that's where my experience is from. So I just kind of wanted to um, gauge uh, people's familiarity with public libraries. Um, so if you could just let me know if you've visited a public library in the last month. Okay, I'm so surprised that there's that many actually. I was thinking it wouldn't be. Um, I, I hadn't really visited many public libraries in my entire life until I started working in one. So it's completely uh, normal if that's the case with you, but I would highly um, recommend checking one out. They have changed quite a bit in the last couple of decades. They're not uh, the same as the library that your grandmother went to or that you went, even that you went to as a child. Um, because things are going digital, um, books are obviously still very integral and very important in public libraries, but um, because they're going digital, people have e-readers, people are able to access those books from home, they, uh, libraries need to find ways to bring people into the library. So you're going to see a lot more services and a lot more technology in libraries now. Um, the Monroe County Public Library has uh, jail service, um, does uh, let's see, has ukuleles you can check out, you know, there's all kinds of different services that they're trying to offer the public so that, you know, you can find value in your public library. Um, and VR um, is one of those and um, is becoming quite common in libraries. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about what some other libraries are doing. Um, but first of all, of all, like VR is actually pretty new in public libraries. So not all libraries are going to have VR. Um, as you probably know, funding in, in public libraries is usually um, based on property taxes. Um, and so in smaller communities, you're not gonna have as much funding for libraries. So those smaller public libraries aren't going to tend to have it. And also even in larger libraries that have good funding, um, if the director doesn't want to do technology programming, um, you're not gonna see it. And same thing with um, traditional librarians are often um, a little bit reticent to adopt technology. So um, it is still new, um, but it is, definitely coming to public libraries and um, demos and going into schools with um, and doing outreach at the schools are pretty common ways to engage with virtual reality um, in the communities. Um, but there are a couple of um, instances that I found and I'm sure there's a lot more where libraries are really delving deeper and and doing a lot with VR. So um, Santa Cruz Public Library is partnering with their city's Resilient Coast Santa Cruz initiative to give the public an opportunity to see what their coastline might look like in the future due to climate change. And so they're using virtual reality to kind of toggle between the current coastline and the projected future coastline. And that's a project that's currently underway. Um, Maryland State Library has started a developer and residence program. So they're having VR developers come in and, um, and work on their development projects on a big screen so that people can sit around and watch them and ask questions and learn about that field. 
Um, a little bit closer to home, I know the Indiana State Library is offering um, VR headsets for free for public libraries to borrow for three months so that they can engage with their communities if they can't afford it or if they want to try it out before they invest. So those are just a couple of things that are, I know of so much more out there, but I'm going to stick to what I know, which is the Monroe County Public Library and what we had been doing with virtual reality. So um, we acquired two headsets in the summer of 2016, right about when they came out, Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive. Um, that my library administration came to me and said, we have a bunch of money and we need you to spend it. So it's a pretty cool problem to have. Um, so we got a 3D printer and we got those, those two headsets. And we spent that first year doing just a ton of demos, which is a great way to get to know virtual reality and find out what's out there. So we did things like art, um, VR art with um, tilt brush. We did music VR with uh, audio shield. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with these programs. These are kind of the somewhat the st standard programs, but keep talking and nobody explodes if you don't know about that one is a really cool um, program that you can do with lots of people. So you have one person in a headset and they can actually see this bomb that is ticking and it's going to explode and they can turn it over and there's puzzles all over it and they don't know how to defuse this bomb, but everyone else um, in the room has a binder with instructions and um, they're saying, you know, how many wires does it have? You know, what color are the wires? And the person has to turn it around and figure out how to defuse it. And it's actually really difficult. It usually explodes, but, um, <laughs> but uh, it's a really <laughs> good program to do with uh, numerous people in a um, space like a library. Um, Anyway, so uh, there's a lot of really cool ways to do um, demos, but um, after that first year, we really wanted to figure out what else we could do with VR. Um, so we started doing a couple of more innovative things like 3D print your VR design. So we'd have people use at the time, I think Google Box was one of the only programs that had a really good easy output, 3D model output. So we would um, have them design a sculpture or whatever they wanted and then we would 3D print it for them. They could come back and pick it up later at the library. Um, we'd start taking the VR headsets to senior centers and um, see what they found interesting about VR and, and how they interacted with it. Um, we did some flight simulation, virtual mountain climbing, you know, to try to start having more themed programs. Um, but we still wanted to kind of see what else was out there. And so um, shortly after that, we were able to have Peter Rubin, who's a senior editor at Wired Magazine, come in and talk about his book, Future Presence. And he talked about kind of how virtual reality is changing the way that humans connect um, and what the future might look like. And we had a panel discussion. Um, the mayor uh, came and, you know, tried out the VR. And um, it, was a, it was a really interesting way to see, um, while not using the headsets, to see how VR can be used in a public library to take that conversation a little further um, and to talk about what you can do with VR and what and the implications are. Um, we also wanted to take it again a little further here. And so we decided um, the following summer to do a VR development camp. Um, and we actually uh, did this in partnership with Indiana University, um, folks from the AVL and Research Technologies. Um, Bill's over there, He's, he was here. Um, <laughs> and we coordinated a, um, a five day VR development camp for ages 12 and up. And the makeup tended to be, I think we had about four or five adults and 10 to 15 teenagers show up. And what we ended up doing was deciding to split it into two tracks. So we had a photogrammetry track and they would go out and capture those assets using photogrammetry. They went around downtown Bloomington and um, took um, multiple photos, obviously, around um, sculptures. Um, they went into our local history center and digitized those objects um, or lots of different historical artifacts from Monroe County. And then they brought those assets back to the other track who was creating the downtown experience. So the idea was that we were gonna have this virtual map of downtown Bloomington that people could interact with and see the objects that they had gathered from around downtown. Um, so here's a, just a couple photos from the photogrammetry track. Um, they were uh, in the history center there taking photos of the drum. Um, that Godzilla definitely shows up in the final product. Um, and they also learned how to kind of repair meshes and, and, uh, and export those, uh, clean them up and everything. It was really cool to see them getting to do all of, learn all of those new skills. Um, and then here they are in the Digital Creativity Center on computers using Unity to create the VR environment. And there's Bill in the bottom left there doing some active teaching. Um, and I know that, you know, they had sleepless nights preparing this. And I think, you know, it was, it was a lot of work. Um, it was pretty impressive that, that it was done in a week. 
Um, so the last day was a Saturday. We had family and friends come in. Um, you can kind of see in the upper left hand corner that um, you know they were in being able to see those digitized objects in their virtual environment. Um, actually, some of those kids that are in that um, upper left photo are now dedicated VR volunteers at the library, and I guarantee they will go into some kind of field related to it. Um, they come to every single program and run the program, help us run the programs, and sometimes we wouldn't be able to do them without the, those volunteers. So, I mean, that's one impact right there um, of this kind of program. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk about just a, another um, experience that we decided to try. Uh, again, trying to go a little deeper with VR and try to figure out um, how to take the conversation further. So um, we decided to try out Explore Black History Month in VR. And this was in partnership with a doctoral candidate from IU. Um, and she was studying African-American and African diaspora studies here. And we kind of um, did some research, found some programs that um, we thought would be meaningful in this kind of a discussion to discuss black history um, in this country. So um, let's see, uh, before I show you a little clip of, of these programs, um, the way we kind of decided to ar arrange this program was that I would be in the VR headset and I would demo the programs up on the big screen and, you know, mirrored up on the big screen for the audience so that they could see them. And then they would have the chance afterwards to try out the experiences. Um, and we had a panel discussion as well afterwards, which was really important in this um, situation because there was a lot to discuss from these programs. Um, the first one was called um, I Am a Man, and it's an interactive VR experience created by Dr. Derek Ham from NC State. Um, it places the um, participant in right in the middle of a civil rights movement um, in Memphis during the sanitation worker strike. You actually experience a lot of the events leading up to the assassination of, of Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, and it's a pretty heavy um, experience and there was a lot to discuss. Let me see if I can just play a little um, trailer. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, this wasn't playing on the screen. I'm sorry, you guys. Uh, that's just the audio. I'm not really sure why that's happening. Hmm. Are you seeing it on your screen? Yep. <laughs> sorry. I'm just looking straight down at my screen. Um, I mean, it's not essential necessarily, but. It... Where is it playing on your screen? Uh, in the browser. Oh, uh, yes. How do you just start it? You just click in here. Should be able to bring the browser on. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, I know about technology, I promise. Um, okay. <laughs> so sorry about that. Let's start that over again. Okay. Okay, there we go. All right, um, so that was the first experience and um, these did kind of go in a past, present, future kind of um, uh, direction. So this was kind of a, a discussion or a, um, a survey of what kind of was happening partially in the past. And then we went into kind of a more present day um, experience uh, called the People's House, um, which is 
the Obamas, Michelle and Barack Obama, giving you a intimate journey inside of the private residences and the executive areas of the White House and reflecting on their time in the White House. Um, and so I can attempt to give you another little preview of this one if you'd like. Okay, that's going to work better. We moved so far away from the Constitution that in many ways we don't even, I remember when I first walked in and I looked around and I thought, um, it's actually not as big as I imagined on television. It really does feel like home to us. Uh, there are two floors upstairs uh, above the state floors, and that's where our home is. That's where our children have grown up. The White House is the people's house, and Michelle and I always joke, uh, we're just writers here. Okay. You actually feel a lot more like you're sitting right there with them um, than, that, than that preview gives you the idea that. You will be. Um, but yeah, that one's really cool. And then um, the more futuristic experience, and I know that's a lot of text, and I'm actually going to read it because this um, futuristic experience, neurospeculative Afrofeminism, is so uh, just different and it's very hard to describe. So I'm actually going to read this to you. I apologize. But uh, neurospeculative Afrofeminism is an award winning three part digital narrative that sits at the intersection of product design virtual reality, and neuroscience, and is inspired by the lack of multidimensional representations of Black women in technology. The NSAF products range from sunblock for traveling through the multiverse to earrings embedded with cameras that offer protection and visibility. The VR experience is set in a neurocosmetology lab where Black women are pioneering techniques of brain optimization and cognitive enhancement. Ultimately, the project focuses on scientific research exploring the neurological and physiological impact of showing images of empowered Black women as well as content made for and by women of color. So you can see why I could not describe that very well, probably on my own. Um, but I'm going to give you a the little preview, but it really doesn't do it justice, but I'm still going to show you just so you can get some of the aesthetics. Um, So I definitely suggest you guys check out these experiences if you get the chance to. Um, we're not going to go into a deep discussion about this, but there was definitely a lot to talk about. Um, most notably, I would say uh, the first and the last one, um, you actually embody the physical body of an African-American. And so being a white person embodying an African-American body, there's a lot of discussion about um, the implications of that kind of technology and what you know might be happening in the future with VR and what kinds of things we need to keep an eye out for and think be really thoughtful about. So it was a really great discussion and a really interesting program. Um, I'm just going to talk about one last thing and then I'll, I'll be wrapping up. But um, I know that it was mentioned a little bit yesterday, but we also have Rome Reborn with Bernie Frischer, who is a digital archaeologist here at um, Indiana University. And he brought his um, experiences Rome Reborn to the library a couple of times. Um, he would talk about the experience and then we did, um, he brought in nine uh, goes and people were able to try out the experiences and he's got five experiences now. His most recent one is the Colosseum District um, and one of the really cool ones is a flight over ancient Rome where you're in a hot air balloon and you can actually toggle between um, the current cityscape of Rome and ancient Rome as it was in uh, 320 AD. Um, yeah. Uh, and this is a really cool program. Actually, we got most, we got about 30 people each time we did this program. And 
most of them had no interest in VR. They were actually here for, to, to learn about um, Rome, ancient Rome. And so it was really cool actually to get them in headsets and get them using VR and experiencing it. And a lot of them were really interested in coming back to other programs at the library. So um, a couple of other things that we've done all day VR where we block off the entire day and people can have an hour with the headset just to themselves. So they can actually go a little bit deeper into the programs instead of those 15 minute demos they usually get. I called it ultra hot or, or ultra VR, um, but Chauncey's um, VR experience that um, hot air balloon ride out there, I think he calls it 4D, but um, that one is really popular because he brings in the heat lamps and the, and the wind. And it was a really, really popular experience. I think we had like a hundred people come to that one. Um, we've showcased independent developers. We've um, upcoming at the library, they're gonna be doing um, adults only VR, which sounds very risque, but um, one of the problems that we run into in the library would, was um, that people would come to these programs with their kids and I would say, do you wanna try it out? And they'd say, no, 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 let the kids do it. And it was very frustrating to me because um, most of the time the headset didn't even fit on the kids' heads and uh, the experience was too sophisticated for them. And it was so frustrating because I'm thinking this is for you. So we're gonna, they're gonna have programs that are just for adults. Um, a Beat Saber tournament, um, we're gonna come in and have an artist come in and do a tilt brush um, demo, things like that. Um, so this is, these are the kinds of things that libraries are starting to do um, tr to try to enhance their programming using virtual reality. And just for the, my last slide here, um, you know, what Emma, uh, Jane was talking about, you know, what are the impacts of this, right? So um, just keeping in mind that the vast majority of participants at these library programs don't own a VR headset. In fact, um, many of them have never even tried VR before and most of them cannot afford it. So um, the impacts or the, you know, the intended outcomes are to inform the public about this technology, right? And give them equal access to this technology that they may not have ever been able to try before and to obviously inspire people right to learn um, to maybe even begin creating and um, explore that in their maybe careers or in their education and i think that we've really seen that um, you know as i mentioned before we got, had those vr volunteers um, we've also had other success stories people going on to study this kind of stuff just from coming to our programs at least it feels like that and we hope that's what what's happening and so i think it's really important so um Thank you for listening. And um, if you have any questions, you know. Um, thanks a lot. Something caught my attention as you were speaking in regarding the way to think about integrating the VR, which was you said during the Rome experience, people actually came to the Rome experience or came to learn about Rome, and then they happened to also be able to use the VR. And that seems to me to be a really important shift um, and one that I don't know how to how one would capitalize on them in relationship to say the collection or what you might do in the future. But that that's a, a really important moment, I think, to stop and reflect, wow. It wasn't the technology, it was what the technology, the technology just enabled something, but I really wanted to understand something. It's that moment that I think the VR is, um, how do you say, people will adopt it and accept it simply because it allows something that they want to get to. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I didn't mention, but um, Bernie Fisher actually donated three Oculus Go's to the library very recently, right before I left. And so, um, you know, we made sure to let all of the programming librarians, because there are just a couple of us who are doing VR programs specifically, but there are a lot of librarians there doing all kinds of things that have nothing to do with technology and they have no interest in technology. But we're trying to get them to realize that, um, you know, their genealogy um, program, maybe it could be enhanced by some kind of VR experience. And so I think you'll start to see that too, where you have a kind of non uh, technology related program that's maybe going to start being enhanced by, um, you know, some, some just some uh, VR headsets and things like that. So. Um, I have another question. So first, thank you uh, for this presentation as somebody on the academic side of libraries. It's really wonderful to see these programs taking off. It's kind of amazing the last year to how many students coming into university tell us that they have had experience with VR. So that's really great. Uh, my question for you is how do you handle a wear and tear with having so many people that's a good, a good question. It, it definitely happens. Um, one thing that we try to do is um, keep 
uh, them clean, so sanitize in between people. That's also just a great hygiene uh, thing to do. But um, we do have to replace like parts of them. So luckily, most of the headsets do have that like removable face uh, piece that you can exchange. And you know, we've had both of our our headsets, the Vive and the and the Rift, for um, almost four years now. And uh, I keep saying we. I don't work there anymore. But uh, <laughs> um, and they haven't had to be replaced at all. They haven't had to be repaired or replaced and they've been used hundreds of times. So it's actually, they've actually done really well. Um, we have had to replace the, just the little parts though. So um, it is an issue though, for sure. Any other questions? Any other, any other, yeah, any other questions? I was gonna say that Bernie's stuff is on Steam if anybody's, right? He sells a lot of this low-grown reward is like little snippets for like $3 or something. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that uh, flight over Rome is really cool. Yeah, I had a quick question with um, the GLAMS organization, Galleries, Libraries, Archives, Museums. Uh, we see a lot of interest there in uh, euphoria, like Nate showed earlier, or uh, touch tables to explore maps and things you wouldn't want the public touching. Um, but certainly you won't have access. Do you do some of that as well? You know, they, they don't at Monroe County Public Library. I, I would imagine that um, some of that technology is just probably too expensive. That's one of the reasons I wanted to focus on public libraries because academic libraries might tend to have more money. Um, and, and VR is a really like cost effective way to do pro this kind of programming because they are still relatively cheap. Um, but those kinds of things I think would be amazing. And I think you might see those in like really big systems, but I've never seen that in a public library. Um, but I'm sure that we will probably will, but yeah, a little, maybe a little too pricey. Thanks for the excellent talk. Uh, I was just curious if, if you're wanting to try to start a VR program at a library, who do you, who, who would you have to go to? Is it someone in the media library you're interested in or do you have to go higher than that? Uh, do you mean just, you know, within the, the library itself structure, the structure? Yeah. Oh, okay. It really depends on the library, I think. Um, luckily, I, the Monroe County Public Library gives a lot of control to their librarians. And I, I'm actually, or I was actually in a position where I was library love, librarian level, but had a different um, background and I did not have a, a ML, MLS. Um, my background in, is in media studies, but um, anyway, uh, yeah, you, you, it just really depends on the system. I, I wouldn't even know how other libraries do it, but I mean, for me, it was just a matter of, um, we have the money, as long as we have the money, um, staffing is a huge, huge consideration in libraries because, um, you know, they don't have a lot of funding, so they don't have a lot of staff. And so getting volunteers is a really, um, great way to say that I can do this program because I have volunteers to help out, things like that, but. Just kind of add to that question too, as my perspective is that um, a lot of librarians going through library school focus, there are a lot more classes thinking about technology and the public engagement. And so I think that in the years going forward, there will be a lot of support, just walking in the door asking, you know, or um, showing that interest and getting more uptake in that. Yeah, and I think as um, some of the, you know, old, no offense to those old traditional librarians, but as, um, when, as they start to retire, you'll start to see, I think, a lot more innovation at libraries. I think there's still a lot of people holding out for traditional library services, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. I think traditional library services are amazing. Um, and so I think you're still going to have that for a while and, and probably forever, but I think you're going to start to see a lot more technology going into libraries as you get kind of this new generation in there. So thank you. All right. Thanks, Jen.